hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the ARC seminar. Today we'll have uh, Hamanshu tell us about physics informed machine learning. Yay. <laughs> okay, hello, hi everyone. I'm Hamanshu and I work in the simulating extreme space time group, basically developing code to simulate backwards. And today I'm going to talk about uh, physics informed machine learning. And well, we start. So, <laughs> <that's kind of laughs> <good. laughs> yeah. So, I do not work in this field, and my work is in no way related to this field. And the reason I'm saying this is because, uh, well, there's a category of people who have, um, let's just say, a very high ratio of opinions divided by knowledge, and I <laughs> don't belong to that. So. I, my undergrad guy, he told me one thing that in every field, if you actually end up reading the papers, you will think that, well, every work that's being done is like groundbreaking and going to change everything. But when you actually get into the field, you learn a little bit, just the terms and stuff, you see that, well, it's good work, but not that groundbreaking. So my idea was, well, I had taken a few courses on machine learning and stuff, and I wanted to see that how it's getting applied in physics. So I guess, I guess watched a few YouTube videos, read a few papers and stuff. And well, I formed some opinions and the idea of this talk is to just share with them, share those with you. Okay, so let's start. First, uh, what is machine learning? So let's just say any kind of algorithms that can identify patterns and make predictions. Now, as you can see, this is a very, very broad definition. And it is also very old. So if you have been well, on the internet in the no, uh, last 10 years, you will see a lot of talk about neural networks, machine learning. But this is not a new thing. This is a very, very old field. So the term itself was coined in 1959. And it started out as a branch of artificial intelligence research. And um, a lot of things that are today called machine learning are, well, let's just say, called something else as well. For example, curve fitting. In some sense, even that is machine learning. Then you have optimization, model selection, classification, like a lot of stuff. It's just that putting machine learning in your paper gets you more citations, so everybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter even if the background they are just doing a polynomial thing. But then, so why this sudden popularity? Like, why is this? And coming up so much. Okay, so uh, there has been actually a revolution, and but it has happened in the field of speech recognition, natural language processing, image analysis. So basically, your Google Photos, your text-to-speech stuff, and all that. So neural networks have actually made a very significant impact there. They have more or less replaced every other algorithm. And there are reasons behind it. Again, neural networks are a, not a new concept. They have been around for, again, I guess, the algorithm that is used right now, its seeds were sold in like 1990s or something. So what changed in the last 10 years is basically that we got fast and efficient hardware, basically GPUs and TPUs. Also, we got access to very large amount of data. Now, if you know about anything about neural networks, you know that you need a lots and lots of data to train. So like millions of images or just these new language models like GPT-3, they literally scan through all the Wikipedia and stuff. So these things, they were not available before, but they got, well, it became easy to access them. And also like GPUs because you can efficiently train your neural networks there. So these two things became available in the last decade and that basically gave rise to this whole deep neural network stuff. So there's this uh, concept called hardware lottery. And it basically says when a research idea wins, not because it's like you universally superior to another uh, algorithm, but simply because the available software and the hardware is very supportive of it. And that in this case will be GPUs. Now this thing is not uh, like, this hardware lottery stuff, this is, this, this is a blog and a paper written by someone working in Google, so it's not some like outsider saying stuff. It is like generally accepted that one of the reasons why neural networks are so popular and 
effective is because you have GPUs. Okay, so let's actually look at something. So this is NVIDIA H100. This is the NVIDIA offering of server class GPUs. Things you don't see in our laptops and stuff, but the things that actually go into the supercomputers. And there are a lot of things to look at, but look at this first of all. 60 teraflops of floating point 32 operation. And this is just a 700 volt machine. Now this kind of efficiency is like unseen before. But as it turns out in neural networks, especially for the case when you have image analysis or speech analysis, you can also work with just 16 point of floating precision. And in that case, you reach well speeds like this. So just to give you an idea of what 2,000 teraflops even mean, this is top 500 supercomputers uh, performance versus year. And if you look at this graph, so this green one is the average of oh, summed up performance of the top 100, top 500 supercomputers. This one is the basically the fastest supercomputer. This one is the slowest in the sense that the 500th rank supercomputer, so not slow in any way, but still. So we had 2,000 teraflops here, and look at where we are. So for 700 watts, you have a GPU that can train your neural networks almost as fast as a whole supercomputer. Now, of course, that these numbers are not. So these numbers are calculated, let's just say, more legitimately, and these are just uh, marketing bullshit. But still, <laughs> even if you get like, I don't know, 10% of this performance, which you can achieve, mm -hmm. if your neural network has all the architecture and well optimized, even then, like you can see that this is big, right? You suddenly have a lot more computing power in your hands. And well, you can train big, big neural networks with it. So like there's this recent talk of new um, neural network being trained by Microsoft, which will have 175 billion parameters or something. So like, like there was a time when people used to say, give me 40 parameters, I will fit an elephant. And now we have well, 175 billion parameters. So you shouldn't really be surprised if it actually works. OK, so let's see. What is a neural network? This is um, just a very brief overview. And the idea is to tell that neural networks are not like magic or anything. In some sense, they are very, very simple. So OK, so this architecture, this is what you will see most of the time when you type neural network. This is called simple feed forward neural network. And this is like the most basic architecture that you get. The idea is very simple. You have some inputs, and you have output. In between, you have these other nodes called hidden layers. Now, these arrows that you see, each of them, they have a weight. So each arrow can have a numerical value, like 1, 2, 3, whatever. Then each hidden node, it also has a bias, again, a numerical value. Now, to get the value, the idea is, let's say you have some input. Now, this hidden layer, it will have a value. How do you calculate it? Well, you just follow the arrows. Whatever input multiplied by the weight plus the bias. And you basically do this for all the hidden layers. So if you have modern neural networks have like, hundred deep, like hundreds of these hidden layers and thousands of these nodes and stuff. So yeah, it can get pretty big. But you can see like it's not a very complicated operation. And then you have a sigma in front of it. What is sigma? Well, sigma is just it will change on, it's just a nonlinear function. In most of the cases, just like a sigmoid function or tanch or anything. The idea is that this thing doesn't grow too big. If you know tanch is basically, it maps everything to minus one to one. Yeah, so this is just a simple function. And then you keep on repeating this. And finally, you get some output. The idea is that you find the appropriate value of W and B. So again, some free parameters in your function. That gives you the desired output for your input. So this is what we call as training a neural network. So again, this thing, as it turns out, can be very efficiently mapped onto a GPU. There's this algorithm called back propagation. And well, 
those speeds that I showed, it turns out that you can actually get very, very close to those speeds if you do this thing on GPUs. It has been optimized to that extent. So if you see a neural network, you just have to think, well, it just has lots and lots of parameters, and at the end of the day, we are doing some kind of targeting. OK. Now, let's see. What are different type of neural networks in use? So the thing that I showed, this is called a feed forward neural network. And there is a theorem which is called universal approximation theorem. And it basically states that for, uh, if you have enough number of these hidden nodes and your sigma is a, a nonlinear function, then you can basically fit anything you want. So you can have any input and get any output, continuous of course. So this is a mathematical theorem. I don't think anybody cares about it. It has been proved for some cases, but yeah. I mean, in general, the whole field of neural network research, the mathematics is on the weaker side. Like, people usually just play with these things, and if they work, they publish a paper, but nobody bothers with like, why it works and anything. So yeah. But as it turns out, this simple feedforward neural network, it, so if you try to use it, it may work, but it's neither the most efficient way, and how do I put it? It's not the best way, I'll just say. So as I said earlier, that uh, there are fields that have basically been basically totally overtaken by neural networks, and two of them are vision related stuff, so recognizing images and all that, and the second one is text and speech processing. So in case of things that require image analysis, the most efficient networks are these things called convolution neural networks. And basically, just the basic idea is you take what? OK, forget about the basic idea. I mean, OK, so the basic idea of a convolution neural network is actually pretty simple. So let's say you want to recognize an apple in an image. Now, the thing is that that apple could be anywhere in the image. The fact that it's on the top left top corner of your image or the bottom right corner, it doesn't change the fact that this is an apple, right? So you want to embed this information into your network. You want to tell it that do not bother about the absolute position of things. Look at the shapes, look at the relations, and things like that. Now you can imagine, if your neural network knows this, if it is in some sense translation invariant, then it would work good with images. So this is basically the rough idea of how CNN works, or the concept that they are based on. So they are good at dealing with spatial dependencies. And of course, they are, shift, they are also called shift, shift invariant, space invariant, and you get the idea why, because they do not care a lot about the positioning of stuff. In the uh, field of language processing, there's another architect, architecture, yeah. There's another architecture of neural networks that's very famous, or that is mostly used, and it's called recurrent neural network. Now, if you think about how would you process a speech, let's say I'm saying something. First of all, when will my speech end? Let's say I'm saying something like, I'm a good boy. Okay. So now this sentence has whatever, five, six words. But you could have a possibly longer sentence or a shorter sentence. And when you try to do things like translation, when you go from, let's say, English to Hindi or something, there's like no one-to-one -one correlation. You cannot translate things word by word. You cannot translate I, then this and that. So you have to have this tempor uh, temporal dependency in the sense that while you are getting the new data, you have to keep in mind what was said earlier. And this is something that's again, encoded in the, the structure of uh, recurrent neural networks. So they are good at dealing with temporal, uh, temporal dependencies because they have uh, internal memory and all that. Okay. So what was the point of all telling all this? The point is that if you are thinking about solving something using a neural network, and well, it's not enough to just take a simple feed for all neural network and throw everything at it not going to work. I mean, yes, GPUs are cheap, in the sense that you can learn things in them for quite cheap. Yes, they are very efficient algorithms to train them, but still you have to do the work. 
It's not like you just throw anything at a neural network and it will learn. Okay, so how do we use it in physics? Okay, so first thing, maybe you already are using machine learning in your machine learning in physics. Basically, if you are doing curve fitting, you can possibly write machine learning in the heading of your paper. And there, then there are some other ways. So again, you can use it as a glorified interpolator. So usually for interpolation, you will use polynomials and all that. But you can use a neural network also there, no big deal. In some cases, it actually performs well. In some cases, it doesn't. Again, case by case basis. But uh, this is actually one, case, uh, one area where it is used quite heavily. And that is fine, again, for data analysis. So let's say that you are getting so I think it's used in astronomy, I'm not very sure. But there you have a large amount of images and stuff, and you need to classify them. You, a human needs to look at them and say, well, this is an interesting image, and this is not an interesting image. Basically, the kind of stuff that neural networks are already good at, basically the CNNs. Also, they are being trained by Google and stuff, so they are also efficient. So in those cases, you can actually use them quite well. Also for time series data and stuff. And again, they are being used. Now, the most interesting part, and when I say how to use machine learning in physics, the one that I'm really interested in is, can we solve differential equations with it? Because most of what a lot of us do is solving differential equations. So can a neural network or machine learning in general help with this? And then there are these other stuff, much more popular in, uh, again, closely related, and much more popular in fields like robotics and engineering. Not so much in physics, but I don't, maybe it is, I don't just know about that thing much. But, okay, so we'll basically focus on solving differential equations using neural networks. Again, I want to say that this is nothing new. The first time this concept was introduced was in 1998. That how can you solve a neural net, uh, use a neural network to solve a differential equation. But then they didn't have GPUs or efficient algorithms, so well, it was just a paper which was hardly cited. And in the last four or five years, it's becoming one of the most cited paper because well, now you have GPUs. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Like we already have a lot of well-researched and well-developed algorithms. So why would you want to use neural network to do this? Okay, so um, let's just put it like this. There's not a lot of mathematical research solid mathematical research or any kind of solid proof that NMS will perform better than your traditional solvers. But, depend, but because they have performed so well in other fields, we have some intuition about in what fields can they outperform our current algorithms. So again, this is very speculative and totally possible that in five years, the people working in this field will start giving different reasons. But these are the ones that are well currently given. Again, this is uh, based on this paper, Physics and Strong Machine Learning, a review paper in Nature, quite good, and from one of the guys who, who's, well, let's just say, down to earth, in the sense that he realizes that, well, it may not change everything, but it's just like slow, slow progression and stuff. So yeah, reliable paper. Anyways, so one thing that neural networks uh, can do very well is that they can incorporate noisy data. Okay, so think about this. Let's say that uh, you want to integrate an equation and your initial data has some noise, which is true for most of the cases when you take initial data from the environment. So can you use your normal Lange foot or any other stuff to solve this? Now, you may think, well, I think I can. I mean, I can put in some profile of, uh, let's say the noise, do some estimation and stuff. And maybe I can make it work, like possible. Uh, then what happens when you get boundary data from a completely different source, and maybe it's more noisy, less noisy, you don't know. Now again, you may be able to do it. If it's little and complete, you can uh, interpolate it and do, well, you can do it. But the thing is, it will be a mess. And for each and every new differential equation, you'll have to do this again and again. Maybe something will work in one case and not in another case. So this is one of the main selling points of these neural networks. That they can work very well with noisy and real-time data. 
what else? So once you train a machine learning model, it's actually much more robust towards these outliers and incomplete data. Now what's that supposed to mean? Let's say that you have in your initial data, and due to some malfunctions, one or two points in that initial data is like completely off, like 10 out of magnitude different. A normal traditional solver will just fail there, unless you, of course, have put in some filters or whatever. ML models, on the other hand, because uh, because of the way they function, like they are approximating something, they are actually much more robust to these kind of noises. In some sense, they filter it out themselves. Now, again, yeah, it depends, but this is something that people observe in the models that they have trained, and it works. The other thing is no complicated mess generation is required. Now, if you have solved any kind of differential equation of relevance, you will know that one of the most irritating things is to deal with mess generation. Now, in physics, we are actually quite lucky that, uh, well, our meshes are, let's just say, the domain where we have to define them is still good, like big square, big circle, something. People in engineering, well, they have to deal with pipes, with bends, and God knows what else. So there it becomes an like, even greater issue. The thing that neural network people say is that, well, in our case, you don't need this. You just give us initial data, and we'll give you the output. Like, fine. Now, this is another thing. The, maybe not in physics, but in biology, in chemistry, and in robotics, etc. The number of equations that you have is like huge. Like you have hundreds of equations representing a single chemical process. And if you try to use traditional techniques, they work, they work fine. But there's this thing called curse of dimensionality. And uh, you might have noticed it in like normal stuff. Solving an equation in 1D is much, much easier than solving it in 2D because suddenly you just have any square stuff. Like a lot more computation time is required and stuff like that. Now, oh, one of the claims is that neural networks can actually bypass this thing. They perform very well in case of higher dimensional data, higher dimensional, uh, what do you call it, differential equations. Again, it comes from experience. So if you look at image analysis and you try to think of what's the dimension of an image, if that word makes sense. In a sense, like what's the degrees of freedom present in an image? Now, literally every pixel in there could be like a completely different thing. Like it can take any value. So if you just multiply that, you will get God knows what. It's like very, very big value. In reality, that's not true. Like we don't see each and every pixel. We see correlations and stuff. But the point is that we still don't know that how big this whole basis space of this vector space of images is. It can be really huge. It is really huge. But neural networks can somehow learn through all that. The idea is the rough intuition is that somehow they can find a reduced uh, basis for your function. So let's say you have sine, and you try to represent it in using traditional polynomials. You will need a lot of coefficient. You try to present it in Fourier basis, you will need a number. What happened? Well, you went to the appropriate basis. In neural networks, you don't know what that basis is, and you don't care. But the intuition is that internally, they somehow learn that basis. And for your problem, they can use in that basis, because they are working on that basis, they work on this curse of dimensionality. OK, and then this other stuff. Once trained, a neural network can be uh, evaluated very, very fast. Now, training is costly. But again, you have cheap GPUs. But once trained, it's just like a bunch of matrix multiplication. Some things that GPUs just excel at. So it can be very, very fast. Now, there are a lot of examples. Uh, one, uh, a lot of people are working in Caltech as well. There was this one example where they were able to solve the fluid equations like 1,000 times faster than a uh, traditional uh, thing, traditional algorithm. But uh, when I say solve, they make, basically make, make predictions. So training took a lot of time, that's fine. But once you train it, the subsequent uh, predictions, they are very, very fast, like 1,000 times faster. Again, there's a catch there, but this is in general true, that once chain neural networks are fast. OK, so now we know something about neural networks and why we want to use them. And then comes the concept of pins or physics involved in form neural networks. Now, right in the beginning, I told you about those two architectures, 
convolution neural network and recurrent neural networks. The idea was that you want your neural network to know something about your problem. If you just give it some data and want some output, then there are things that it has to learn. There's like a lot of stuff that it has to learn. You don't want to do that because then it will take a lot of time to converge and stuff. You want to give it some information about your problem itself. For example, in case of CNNs, we want to tell the networks that will try to look for spatial dependencies because that is what we are interested in. So when trying to solve differential equations, you want to give it some information that you are trying to solve a differential equation. You have to somehow incorporate that into your net neural network. Otherwise, it won't train. It will be very, very slow. Now, universal approximation theorem says that you may be able to do it. But just because there's a mathematical theorem doesn't mean that it will be like feasible in any sense. So the idea behind physics informed neural network is that you basically give your neural network some information about the differential equation itself, along with the boundary conditions and all that. You tell it what it, uh, you basically say that, well, don't try to learn any function. Try to learn functions which form a basis for this differential equation, in some sense. OK. So let's take an example. You have this Burgers equation. And you want to learn about it. So you will have, well, initial data and then boundary condition. How do you incorporate these, uh, the, how do you incorporate the physics in the neural network? The simplest way is you incorporate it into the loss function. Now, uh, well, I guess, OK. So whenever you do an optimization problem, you always have this loss function, which is nothing complicated. It just tells you how far are you from your desired output. So if you want, let's say, your output to be 1, then you will maybe take a least square. So you will say, this is my current output minus 1, and just square it. So if that number is big, you know that well you are far away from your desired output. So that is loss function. And you can incorporate this whole information in your loss function. So let's see how it's done. So let's see. You, have, you want to learn u, which satisfies this differential equation. And then there are some boundary conditions. OK. So first you say, I'm going to approximate u using a neural network. Again, your simple feedforward neural network. You will provide it x, you will provide it t, and it will give output u. OK. Now how do you incorporate the information about differential equation in there? OK. So you take derivative of this whole neural network with respect to these variables, maybe even the second derivative if your differential equation requires it. And then add it to the loss. So your loss function is, so L data here is uh, basically this thing about your boundary condition. And there's this LPD, which is basically this whole PDE. So if you see, if the neural network actually learns the correct solution, then this thing will be 0. So this component of your loss will be 0. And if it learns the current boundary condition, then this will be 0. So idea is actually very simple. You want to get this law, uh, minimize this loss function, and if this is minimized, then your neural network basically has learned u. So this is, um, yeah, the basic idea behind physics and four neural network. Again, you have to tune these uh, parameters and stuff, and not an easy thing to do. I remember there was this lecture, and a prof was giving this who worked in this field, and after telling all this, he basically said, if you go home and try this on your own, it won't work. And what he meant was that, in theory, it seems like it should always work. Like, it's just an optimization problem for a loss function. But it doesn't. Like, you have to play with these parameters and change the architecture, change the learning data. Basically, there are a lot of knobs that you have to turn to get the correct solution, the desired solution. And OK, so these are some examples. Now remember, uh, as I said, neural networks, once trained, are actually quite good in the sense that they can work with incomplete data. So this is, again, the Burgers equation. And you see the boundary data, it's not complete. It's just like scattered here and there. Again, initial data is, again, scattered here and there. There are just 100 data points. And you just feed these points. Like, you don't care. In this equation, if you see, it doesn't care whether your data is initial data, boundary data. It can be literally in the middle of your domain or whatever. The point is that it should just satisfy this function. So you just write this and let neural network do a problem. So once trained, you can give it some data and you'll fit it. 
again, the exact uh, prediction, all that you can see. Uh, yeah, you can see the graphs. Same graph for the Schrodinger equation. Again, same concept. You give the boundary data, you give the initial data, and again, there are gaps and stuff, but you can still solve it. Mm. Okay. So, looking at these graphs, you see there are no error bar, right? And they just want us to see this, these thick lines, and well, they are visually matching, so they may be good, right? So remember when I said that uh, there are these neural networks that do fluid simulations thousand times faster? The catch there was that they are not accurate at all. So you will get like, I don't know, 10% accurate result. Now in some cases that's fine. Like let's say you are trying to uh, model climate and stuff. So having nothing is worse than having at least 10% accurate results. That's fine. In some cases it's fine. But in our case, in our, and by R, I mean, let's say you want to simulate black holes, it's not enough that you are like off by 1%. It doesn't work. So there are a lot of cases where this doesn't work. But there are a lot of cases where this is fine. So the issue is, again, the accuracy. Even if you train your neural network, it may not be as accurate as you want. It may not be as accurate as your traditional algorithms. And this is something that people like really skip over. You will see that state of the, so they will mention something like this. Our neural network is 30% more accurate than the state of the art. And what they mean is this 30% more accurate than the state of the art neural network. They don't mean the traditional algorithm, which can go up to like 10 to the minus 16 or whatever you want. They don't go to those changes. And at least the impression that I got from a bunch of talks and papers is that people are not even targeting those fields. Like nobody is working on a neural network that can simulate black hole by this merger and stuff. People are more interested in using these to do, uh, to do simulations where there are a lot of equations, a lot of data, noisy data, and you just want rapid results. You don't care so much about accuracy. So if you actually look at the, some of the papers, the funding is coming from DARPA and stuff, fine. But there are also these weapon companies that are funding, like Raytheon and stuff, because they are like really interested in how hypersonic missile will move through air. Now, in that case, you, you can see where the utility is. If you can do the simulation 1,000 times faster and with 1% error, then that's good for them. They can make the adjustment there and all that. And again, there are other fields like simulating blood streams, and simulating chemical reactions in robotics, where you get real-time data and you want some prediction. You don't care about accuracy. So even in these cases like this, if you actually plot the error plots, it will be like 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, which may be good enough, but I don't think that's that good enough for um, real use cases. Okay, so this is basically your physics and quantum neural network. And now I'll just go through a bunch of stuff that was in that review paper so that uh, we get some idea about how, like, what else can we do. So you want to reduce the amount of work that your neural network has to do. You want to give it appropriate architecture. You want to uh, like filter through your data to make it more learnable. So there are these, let's, uh, let's give an example. So for example, in our group, we have these surrogate models and they were also trained on a neural network, like I'm talking about in 2018 or something. But it was not like you give, uh, you just take the waveforms and throw it at a neural network. That doesn't work. You have to do a lot of pre-processing of the data. You have to trim down, uh, trim down your waveforms. You have to scale your waveforms. You have to basically put the merger point at t is equal to zero in all of these cases. Because if you don't pre-process your data, neural network will not be able to learn it. If you don't give it like that, uh, you have to learn the merger at t is equal to zero. If you don't give this information to it directly, then it will have to learn that information as well. And you don't have that much data. Like we have like what, thousand simulations or something? 
and expecting some neural network to learn just everything from those causal simulations is not good. So you basically want to do some kind of pre-processing. You want to choose the correct architecture and basically give the correct biases so that you, your training of neural networks is simpler. So roughly speaking, things that you can do can be divided into three parts. First is learning bias, which is what we already saw. In the cost function, you have the differential equation itself so that, well, your neural network can learn it. The other one is observational bias. Here you, again, these are terms, but roughly speaking, the idea is that, as I said, you want to pre-process your data. If you know something about your data, don't just give your neural network raw data. Pre-process it. Make it into something more easier to learn. For example, if you know that there's a function of x and y, and you have some idea that maybe one of the uh, parameter, one of the outputs will have something like x to the power y, then what you can do is you calculate x to the power y earlier and put it as another uh, input. So now your neural network doesn't have to learn this complicated thing. It can just directly work with it. Again, scale, locate, translate, whatever. If you can, if your data in any way can reflect your underlying physics, do it. Again, this is periodic stuff. So let's say that you have periodic data. Now you cannot always give your waveforms to the neural network and expect that it will learn that your data is periodic. Or you can take a Fourier transform so that if already this information about periodicity is already embedded in your data. So that will help. So that is the observational bias where you basically modify your data itself. Then there's this thing called inductive bias. This time, this basically means that you change your neural network architect architecture itself. So for example, the CNNs, the convolution neural network, the, the design of that whole algorithm is, basically it's designed in such a way that it knows that whatever the input is, it will be translation invariant. Similarly, RNNs, the uh, neural networks used for speech recognition, they by default have uh, a capacity to store the previous data so that they can analyze it. So these things, this whole thing, it's part of the architecture itself. So you want your neural network to have some kind of, um, if possible, you want, basically, you want it to satisfy your physical laws directly. Now, it's hard to just explain it like this, but the rough idea is, let's say, uh, okay, so this is like one of the uh, currently used neural network architecture called Fourier layer. And you can see what's happening here. We are doing a Fourier transform, then an inverse Fourier transform, and then you have your weights and stuff. It is not just a simple multiplication with weights and biases. The idea is that maybe this can learn the frequencies much more easily and stuff. So again, this is something that you are do, uh, directly embedding in your architecture. Okay. The issue with this is, now this is the ideal stuff. If your basis function themselves know about your problem, if they by default follow the symmetry of your problem, then they will learn, your, learn from your data much, much easier. But you have to actually find those symmetries, right? And this is not easy to do. This is again, per problem basis, hard to design these architectures. And even if you do, the whole basis of using a neural network was that it can efficiently train on a GPU. Now what if you end up something with something that doesn't train? Well, then you are stuck with something which is slow and God knows what else and may not even perform as well as a traditional algorithm. But yeah, so in general you use a combination of these three. Yeah, you try to make it work. But this gives you an idea that just throwing data is not going to work. You'll have to work and work hard, and you have to work, design your whole neural network, your whole pre-processing around your particular problem, and then maybe, maybe you will get something out of it. So yeah, now we are basically reaching the end, and now this is the question. Why are we not using it to solve everything? Right. Well, I already told a lot of issues with the neural networks, but let's just summarize them. 
First thing is that they are really, really bad at learning high frequency functions. So if you have like sine to the 50x, the your neural network may not even converge. And this becomes really relevant you, uh, when you have multi-scale data. So let's say that you, so multi-scale basically you have two processes happening, but one is much, much faster than the other. Uh, I can't really think of an example. Let's just say sun, rotate, uh, sun rotating around the galaxy and moon rotating around the Earth. They are correlated, but if you try to track the motion of the moon, you will get this whole circle and the moon will do this wiggly thing all around the stuff. So there are these multiple time scales. If you try to use a neural network directly, it will learn that whole revolving of sun around the galactic center, but that wiggle of the moon will well, it won't be able to learn it because it's very, very high frequency. Again, solution accuracy is bad. You can solve it really, really fast once you have trained the network, but the accuracy will, may not be good. And to be honest, you don't even know if this can be improved. So let's say that you want to learn a neural network that gets you accuracy of 10 to the minus 16. It may end up being that you are using so many parameters that you are better off using a traditional algorithm. You don't just know this. Like, this is not uh, established in any way. Right now, people are fine with 10 to the minus 4 or whatever accuracy, which is not good for a lot of stuff. Again, no bound on errors. Like, the reason we use RK4 or anything is that if I give you some estimate using that, I also know I'm bound on the error. Now, let's say I give you a neural network and you put in some input and you get some output. How do you know that the output is like correct? Like it could be like totally off. There's no, like there's no bound there. Again, some work is being done here, but right now it's just, yeah. Again, different problems. Your prob uh, you may need to design a completely new architecture for your particular problem, for it to be efficient and all. So again, not a trivial thing. Yeah, most of the time, it's just a complete black, black box. So, lots and lots of issues. And to be honest, I don't really see these issues getting resolved anytime soon. Like, these are not small problems. Like, how do you get a bound on error? How do you get this, like, how do you interpret what your uh, neural network has learned? In image recognition, you don't care. Like, if it's accurate for, 99% of the time, it's good. In simulations, you can't do that. You can't be like, I'm, well, this is my integrator, it's accurate 99% of the time. And you don't know when it's not accurate, so that's not done. We're not even sure if they will ever be able to do this. So this is like a, yeah. I never knew that this thing actually has a name, but it's, it has a name. And this is, you get some new technology, and then there's like peak of inflated expectation. And we are somewhere here right now. Like, <laughs> if you go to archive and search machine learning and physics, the number of papers is just like, you will think that everybody is literally working on this only. And if you actually start reading the paper, people will be like, okay, this differential equation, I was able to solve with this much address. Like, very, very small stuff. But like, everyone is trying it everywhere. And then, when eventually we are going to reach here, and then we'll think, well, I don't think they are going to work anyway. And then, well, eventually you get uh, some kind of stability where, yeah, there are some cases where it's useful, some cases where it's not. So, yep. That was my two. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, this seems very pessimistic. Problem. What? Pessimistic. <laughs> that too. Yes. Uh, I was gonna say it seems very problem dependent. Mm -hmm. So that when if you, you can't use this if you like don't know exactly what problem you're working on. Like if you have a differential equation, but you don't know the source terms for the differential equation, you wouldn't be able to use this because every time you add a new source term, you have to redo all of this analysis of priors and stuff that you were talking about mm -hmm. to get to actually train it. Exactly. So again, that is, like, exactly. 
for every new problem, it's totally possible that you will need to redo everything. That is always a possibility, and that is like again a big issue. Now, um, there, let's just say this: uh, neural networks are good in a very different way. So let's say that you want to train a neural network to recognize your own handwriting. Now there are uh, models that can recognize handwriting, but you realize that well, my uh, B and A are very similar, so it's failing there. So you want to retrain it so that it can do it better. So there's this concept called transfer learning. The idea is that well, we already have a neural network that can work with generic writing and stuff. Now my A and B, I just want to retrain it on those two parameters. So what you do, you take the old model and just add one, two more layers. And then train just those two layers. And suddenly you have a model which can not only recognize like others writing, you can only you can like accurately predict yours. In that sense, neural networks are very additive. Like everything they learn, you can always build up on that. So maybe in future we have like a very, very big neural network, like 175 billion parameters, which is well, which if you give it a differential equation. It can tell you, well, this will be the best algorithm to use, and it may even write the code for you and stuff like that. And by the way, this the write the code for you is not a like what you say, fairy tale stuff, it's actually happening. Neural networks can write some form of code. So you never know, like in 10 years, maybe not in this current iteration, like you won't directly use a neural network to solve a differential equation, but if you can give it a differential equation and it can maybe give you insights about it and write part of code for you. That, that's also there. Mm. Yeah, any more question? So, um, as far as I know, we also need to make an initial guess on what partners of this network, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And we guess that might be also really problem dependent thing. Again, yes. Again, as I said, we need to turn on a lot of knobs. Yeah. So, <laughs> initially, those, remember those weights and biases? What value do you give to them? Like, you, it could be random numbers, it could all be zero. As it turns out, it affects how well your net, network will train. So you have to tune that as well. So yeah, it, it's, yeah. When you look at the papers, it will say state of the art, easily done and all that, but it's not. It's, <laughs> it's not easy. I mean, you can just uh, try to pro program a neural network to learn sign function, like literally, sign x between minus one to one, and you will see the kind of problems that you will face. It's, yeah, it's not as easy as it's made out to be. Uh, um, any more question? Okay. All right, uh, let's give another round of applause. <laughs> some logistical details. Uh, so two weeks, it's Memorial Day. I know you're all looking forward to it and remember that it was happening, so we're not gonna have this. <laughs> two weeks after that, there's apparently a donor event, which you, you all are, apparently know about. Uh, yeah, so then that Thursday will be May 19th. Yeah, that Thursday at the same time. And then the one week after will be, I guess, one of my friends uh, from uh, U Hawaii. Uh, we'll be talking about something probably planets or astrochemistry related. And then I think three weeks after that is Yunsu. And I won't be there, so somehow you'll figure out how to do it without me. Um, <laughs> and then that's like very far in the future. So hopefully we, you know, more stuff happens in the meantime. <laughs> All right, thanks.